Uh, welcome back now. The Minister of Transportation, Rotimi Amechi, has blamed the delays in major projects, including railways, and the inability of the Chinese to fund them. Amechi said the federal government has started looking for loans in Europe following the refusal of the Chinese to fund Nigerian project. While speaking to the press, the minister ex expressed hope that Nigeria could get loans from Europe to complete existing project. Amechi said the Abuja Itakbe Railway is underway, which will link the existing Itakbe Delta rail line. He said the link uh, rail would have been completed, but for misunderstanding with a Chinese contractor. Now, joining us to discuss this is Gaspol Obele, an economist and Arava Obo, a foreign affairs analyst. Uh, Good evening to you, gentlemen. All right, we'll start with Gospel. Good gospel, evening, good evening to you. Yeah. Many thanks uh, for staying with us. Uh, let me just put it um, in a lay sense. Uh, maybe you try and um, give me some explanation. Over time, Africans generally have been so, so reliant on um, Asian countries, specifically China, for, you know, uh, to build the infrastructure, you know, railway, airport, uh, concessionings, and all of that. And right now, the Chinese uh, seem to have some sort of misunderstanding with Nigeria. That's according to the Minister of Transportation, Rotimi Amechi. Gospel, what do we really have on our hands right now? You know, we are looking in the direction of Europe. Is it the right way to go? Well, um, thank you, first of all, for having me. Great again to be here. Mm. Um, it's very important to start with the fact that Nigeria cannot currently fund its infrastructure needs in terms of infrastructure expenditure. Um, it costs a lot to build critical infrastructure. And as a result, the government has to look for alternative means to, to infrastructure financing, as it were. Um, also being the fact that, you know, when we've had a rollout of uh, inaction, sorry, right, coming all mm. through um, since 1999, even during the military era, we refused to do the right things at the right time, you know, and all of those problems have piled up, um, aggravating into the current of a new crisis that we have right now. So um, infrastructure must be built going forward. So the government has to look for a very other alternatives to in financing infrastructure. Secondly, um, we do not have enough, how would I put it, um, human capital in the sense required to take these intelligent or smart infrastructure projects. So some form of reliance of, all right, will be required to of take a few of these things and, and all of that. Again, speaking to the fact that um, inactions and bad public leadership has also led us to this point. So we don't have an option than to find um, other means to infrastructure financing. However, debt is not the only route, in as much mm. as debt is not a bad option. Um, it just means that we've not probably, probably handled these debt financing options rightly, you know, in terms of borrowing for infrastructure financing and all that. And until we've been able to plug that into the mainstream and also onboard a critical mass of the economic agents for productivity on that mainstream, we may not be able to convert all of these borrowings or even infrastructures we are building into good revenue streams for us to be able to pay back and still grow in terms of economic sustainability, um, productivity-wise, yeah. All right, I, I, I like your opening, Salvo. You, you mentioned a whole lot of um, points. You talked about uh, issues with infrastructural financing. You talked about inaction over the years. But the next question right now would be, you said uh, rightly that uh, debt isn't an issue. It is actually one, of, uh, one other alternative to financing infrastructural, uh, infrastructure in the country. But then again, as a country, looking at how far we have come over the years with all the borrowings that we uh, have had, would you say that we are really neck deep in debt, and uh, are we in way over our head at the moment? So yes, two sides to the question, yes and no, because number one, we are really neck deep in debt, right? Looking at our potentials to pay back, looking at um, overall economic investment returns and all that, we do not have what it takes, right, to service the, I mean, if you look at the current um, change into budget, right, your oh. debt size is almost equal, all right, to the capital expenditure size, True. if not slightly higher. Mm. And if you look at that consistently over the years previous, because of time, I don't go into numbers, mm -hmm. you see that it's been exact same size, you know, in terms of debt financing, sorry, debt deficit and, um, um, uh, and, and, and the capital expenditure bit. So it's a call for worry because we haven't been able to restructure the economy into um, some form of 
um, um, growth financing, bigger revenue prospects, especially from non-oil, by particularly positioning non-oil for export competitiveness and improved um, um, enabli- uh, sorry, business environment, as it were. Right? So haven't, not having done that has led us to a position where we only depend on the oil sector all right, and strangled economic agents on taxes and all of that. So we're in a very bad position to be able to um, um, sort of uh, service our debts and as well as pour debt financing into critical investment vehicles for growth and development. Right now, um, we also have a structured public expenditure in such a way that there's high government waste, all right, and you know all that story and all that. So mm. uh, debt financing options or um, infrastructure financing options are not landing on the critical investment vehicles, all right, which makes it um, a bit difficult for us to service debt um, going forward in the long term, looking at where we are as a nation, our budget, our revenue, our capacity, productivity-wise. On the flip side, all right, most advanced countries, all right, have grown, thrived, and developed over time, again, on debt vehicles. So, as I said, debt is not necessarily bad, all right, in, in, in the sense of things. All right, advanced countries have um, larger debt profiles, larger budget deficit profiles. And when you have budget deficit profiles, um, sorry, um, budget deficit, the first financing option will be to borrow. All right, so, but, but the question is not if you're borrowing, the question is what you're borrowing for mm. and what base do you have in terms of economic fundamentals, all right, to plow those financing to the right places. And then over time, sustainably, you can pay back your debt as well as scale economic productivity and growth for a critical mass of your own people. Don't forget, China would not give you debt for debt purposes, all right? They would have find some areas within the agreement to plow the uh, machinery or the technical know-how around that infrastructure development for the advantage, not for your own advantage. So we need to find critical ways to not just engage infrastructure finance or debt financing, but ensure that a critical mass of human capital are inclusive in that process of development with debt financing funding All right. until we can do that correctly over time. We may not find any um, results, as it were. All right, so uh, gospel. So invariably what you're saying is that uh, we have um, a whole lot of big issue when it comes to servicing our debt. So if I put it differently, so it's not an issue of uh, geography moving uh, away from Asia or China to maybe Europe to source for this debt because over time it will still boil down to the fact that we are taking these loans and we don't have the capacity you know, to service them. Yes, definitely. It's, but, but then again, if we could have done, um, I mean, if there, was a way, um, 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 if there was a way we can finance most of our development aspirations without necessarily seeking for aid mm. or for help, all right, that would have been the best shot right here. People talk about dead aid and the fact that Nigeria can be self-sufficient and all that. I agree to that phenomenon and that school of thought. But the truth is, no matter how much we preach that, that is not a reality that will be co- that would that will be happening anytime soon. Not why can't Why decade. can't it happen right, anytime so, soon? I mean, number one, we have political correctness about political will. First of all, so okay. your gov- the government doesn't have the will, the political ideology, the, the culture that drives for development aspirations does not look within. All right, to develop and bring out value on a self-reliance basis. All right, the culture has been built over looking outside than looking internally on what you can do. It's at first a cultural problem, then it scales upwards to the ideology around the political class and you know the willingness and all that. So there is more drive to be more politically correct than politically channeled or willed to do the right thing. Even when the will is there, is the ability there? I mean, you may be willing, but you're not able. All right, so the government may be willing, but are they able, being able to talk about capacity, all right, being able to talk about financing and all of that, then when you're able, how are you able to position yourselves to unlock economic potential? So it's, it's, it's a, an engagement that thrives on three important legs, you know, and until that can happen, we may not be able to unlock our self-reliance capability. But that's why I said in the next 10 years, it may not happen. So the only option is to be able to look for where you can borrow from. And all that. So uh, this is not to endorse borrowing or um, aid, but the truth is, at the end of the day, Africa or Nigeria, to large extent, would be dependent on that. You know, um, especially being the cultural elements that drive what we do as a people and as a nation. So I mean, so that's what I see. To a large extent, not a function of if it's Europe or China. It's a function of who we are and the culture we've deployed or developed around developmental financing. So, and gospel, forget, it Europe is really worrying. Not give you monies 
on a platter of gold. No, they it would. Uh, terms and conditions. I was going to say that because I was going to really ask um, if uh, the, the loans that we have had over time from Asia, if it has actually done us uh, more harm than good. Uh, judging by the terms and con conditionalities that they usually you know, bring on the table most of the times? Well, I think it has done us more harm than good, in my own opinion, but um, it's a case of, a, of poor economics. I mean, you're, you're gaining some um, advantage in the short term by getting infrastructure fees. But to a large extent, you know, within the, rock, within the core of those agreements are major capital flight issues and major terms and conditions around human capital, who does what and why, mm -hmm. right? and what is the positioning of the Nigerian people within that growth engine or that infrastructure development engine. Take, for instance, you go on the infrastructure site, you see the average Nigerian using shovels, all right, to pick the stones, to dig up the sand, while you see the main technical bits handled by, you know, the Chinese and all of the likes, mm -hmm. right? They don't just finance this thing. They also use the organizations, or their construction companies to build these things. All right. So, in terms of um, mainstream territorial takeover, all right, you can see that um, um, a play in that in that in, in in the structure of how infrastructure. Sorry, in how infrastructure is being developed and scaled for use over time. Then again, I mean, just to bust the bubble, in some of these agreements, you also have clauses that says that okay, for the next fifteen to thirty years, it will be maintained by A and B and C organization mm. in A and B and C country. You have these clauses there. So Nigerians are not positioned within the grand scheme of things to drive growth and development. So capital flight is at the core, human capital is at the core, all right, and sustainability in terms of growth financing is also at the core. So you keep paying these debts, and your people are not the ones driving the engine. So it's 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 a it's not really a win-win in the sense, all right. It's mm. difficult to get a win-win in those kind of conversations, um, as it were. So we need to do more for ourselves by being self-reliant. All right. Yes, I want us to just conclude on this aspect of um, self-reliance uh, because you have said that uh, it might be impossible over time, you know, because you said that we might still have to resort to borrowing. I'm even more concerned again because, uh, you know, the federal government is giving targets now, you know, no, Senate rather is giving targets to revenue generating agencies, uh, three trillion naira, you know, annually. Uh, that's an issue. Just um, last month, Nigeria could not even meet up with uh, OPEC um, quota you know, for January. So with all of this right now, where can we really generate the revenue internally? Because uh, you said that we don't really have the body language to really want to do all of that. Yeah, it's a very beautiful question because, I mean, that has been my headline thought in other conversations in the media all through the week. Um, the government has a serious revenue crisis. And for a government like us, you know, um, it needs to find a way to solve that problem, all right? But you know, when you refuse to do the right things at the right time, and the problem becomes more complex, you will be pressured on all fronts to do anything you can do to get your way out. And all of those actions get to hurt the economy back and forth again. Over the years, MDAs have been positioned to get more from people than to help them become more. All right? Uh, I mean, we, we're just seeing it now in the news. It's just being made formal in the Senate. We're just talking about it now, but it has always been the case. All right? Average SME works to now that to get a certification. It's more about what they can get from you than what institutions they have in place to help mm. you become a thriving business. All right? So we have a revenue crisis, but our, our approach is more of, you know, trying to strangle economic agents to get more from them. So we need to switch that conversation, all right, to inspire tax compliance, growth and growth, I mean, revenue mobilization, we then need to enable support, all right, come from the software elements. What are you bringing on the table to help people become better? When they become better at what they do, then you are positioned as a government to earn more taxes from them, all right? And then you build the necessary structures and processes to empower more non-all sector-based SMEs so that when they become thriving, they can employ more people, they can give back in more taxes, they can produce goods and services that are competitive on a global level. That way you cannot earn foreign, re foreign, foreign receipts from that window and not just the oil sector window. So there's a lot more we need to do than trying to strangle people or um, economic agents into paying more revenue. Right. And do not forget, the current MDA machinery is actually analog driven. So you're trying to use an analog, imagine trying to use an analog, analog computer in this digital age, and, mm. you, and you're asking yourself, why is it not delivering revenue for me? 
All right. So the MGAs are structured capacity and right. institutionally wise as analog institutions to, to get more value from um, economic agents. So it's a dead and arrival model that would come back to prior to the economy. That's what I'm saying. All right, thank you so much, um, Gospel. It is always a delight yeah, to talk you to you me. about all of um, these uh, economic <laughs> issues. Uh, the whole analog and digital uh, example that you gave was actually a very funny one. Thank you so much, Gospel, once again. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. All right, it is still Plus Politics. Uh, we'll take a quick break, and when I return, I'll be giving you my take. Nigeria's NSAS mass action in October 2020 and the subsequent security force crackdown led to promises that those affected would see justice. But events since then questioned the government's commitment to genuine police reform. The Niger police force continues to inflict extortion and brutality on innocent citizens. And recent decisions on the report of the judicial panel set up by Lagos state government to investigate police abuses have dampened public expectations. Now, the process of ensuring accountability must start from within the Niger police force itself. Measures should go beyond the usual rhetoric without undermining ongoing reform efforts by external stakeholders. And of course, that for revenue, Nigeria should just switch to the convention uh, and try to get more people into the tax net because by so doing, uh, we'll be shoring up all of these uh, losses and, and these uh, shortfalls that we have as a country. It is Plus Politics. I will return again on Friday. My name is Justin Academy. Many thanks for watching.